So, uh, welcome everyone um, to this um, session um, um, for the um, optical um, education series, um, really between um, Janela uh, Research Campus and John Cannon School and the Australian uh, Imaging Community. Um, very happy to have Paul um, Timson from Garvin speaking today. Um, Paul completed uh, his PhD with um, Margaret Frame at the Beeson Institute of Cancer Research in 2002 and has been studying um, act actin cytoskeleton um, um, related um, work with cancer invasion. Um, he then moved to uh, Garvin in 2003 um, to work with uh, Roger Dale um, to investigate role in the actin binding protein um, in growth factors trafficking in breast cancer, head and neck um, cancer. So Paul, it's a pretty, um, I would say, holistic scientist. Um, he's uh, worked, I think, from drug industry, and he, that's evident from his um, AstraZeneca postdoctorate research fellowship, allowing him to work the interface of drug and imaging. Um, he returned to Australia in 20, oh, uh, 2012 to start a cancer program at Garvin. And his current research really focuses on um, pushing imaging technologies and um, pinpointing the molecular drivers of cancer progression and environmental cues that cause resistance to current systematic therapy. So thank you, Paul, for taking your time to present. Uh, I hope you learned a lot about um, how intravital microscopy to help us understand drug delivery and targeting, and in this case, biosensing imaging. Thank you. Thank you, guys, and I really appreciate um, the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I'm just going to give a waiver first to everyone. It may take you about two to three minutes to realize this accent isn't going away. So I'm, I'm going to do my poshest Scottish accent um, so that you can understand. But if you can't understand me, just watch the pictures and we'll be all happy, I hope. So let's just start off with this picture that we're looking at here. Um, I'm going to talk about how we're going to use biosensors and imaging in cancer. And we need to understand how the cancer actually behaves in the real organ or the native tissue and if we're to really understand how we can target it. So this simple image here, which I think is beautiful, um, in green you've got the fibrosis, which is one of the major problems in pancreatic cancer. And in red, obviously here it looks like blood anyway, but this is using quantum dots to look at the blood vasculature. Um, so while this is beautiful, the big problem in pancreatic cancer is that this fibrosis can often be a barrier to drug treatments. So, you know, early on, people were starting to target the extracellular matrix and said the disease got worse. But actually, if you use imaging, you can actually say, well, we don't have to completely ablate the stroma. We can actually manipulate it to our benefit to improve drug penetrance, to open up blood vasculature and improve chemotherapy, et cetera. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, some of the things we'll talk about today. Um, so again, I'll just click on here. Um, okay, so my group essentially works in pancreatic cancer, which I mentioned. The problem with this disease is you can die, of course, from the primary tumor, but it's highly metastatic and spreads. So we need to not only target, for example, the primary site using chemotherapies, we also have to actually look in a holistic manner, as Steve kind of mentioned, where we need to look at the whole body context and say, can we kill the tumor, but also stop any inevitable spreading that may have already occurred um, in this uh, very aggressive disease. Okay, so the big picture. Um, our group makes biosensor mice to look at various hallmarks, I guess, of cancer. So we use threat-based biosensor mice, but we also use various other techniques such as threat or, sorry, such as FAP or um, various other probes that we can actually look at DNA damage, etc. So the mice that we make essentially are cre-inducible. So, and again, before I start here, anyone that wants one of these mice, just contact and we freely send them out. These are interesting for us to look at pancreas cancer, but you can imagine you can quite easily look at um, intestinal, liver, skin, breast, immune system, and even in the bone. So they've been used in all of these. Um, and so you can actually really hone in on your specific disease. So just as a kind of high level to touch upon the mice that we've got, 
We have an EKP of a FRAP mouse, which we can actually FRAP cell cell junctions and watch the early processes of cell cell junctions breaking apart, which actually occurs just before that spreading event. So we can actually predict the breakdown or the induction, I guess, of some sort of EMT transition. As Steve said, we have studied role rack and master regulators of the active cytoskeleton for many years. So we have a role or a rack mouse. And again, we can watch via threat invasive drivers and actually see how drugs can stop this. Some of these that I've actually presented today won't have been published yet. We have a SARC mouse. SARC has also upregulated many diseases. We also can use this to look at DNA damage. We have an AKT mouse. Again, this hasn't actually been published yet either, but should be coming out soon, where we can look at the metabolic changes in cancer. And again, if we move on to the CDK1 mouse, and again, we'll talk about this, we can actually look at mitotic events in situ and actually use this as a surrogate marker of how chemotherapy actually responds. So we can watch individual single cells responding to chemotherapy. And again, hypoxia, and I may touch upon this as well at the end. The picture I showed at the front, which was this snapshot image, well, you know, we all know that tumors evolve and change constantly. So hypoxia, you can see in this little image here, day 10 and day 11, it's constantly moving. The tumor is constantly growing. It's constantly changing its blood vasculature, et cetera. Hypoxia is an area of resistance. And so that resistance is almost like a moving target. And we need to be able to watch it. And we need to be able to see how can we target the environment to reduce this kind of constantly moving resistance um, or the resistant pocket and, for example, pancreas cancer. Okay, so I don't seem to be able to move my slides. Okay. Um, okay, so if we're looking at a real tumor here, I would focus down here on the bottom left-hand corner. You can see that's almost like bolus of a tumor, which is surrounded by extracellular matrix in purple here. And that matrix is really dense and it's collapsing lots of those blood vessels and we're having a real problem getting any drug um, into this tumor area. However, within the same tumor, you can see this gorgeous big blood vessel and nice, easy extracellular matrix. And so spatially, um, not only in temporally, spatially you have different areas. So the idea is that we actually need to be able to target the surrounding tissue um, and actually watch how best or how much to target that ECM to improve drug penetrance, but being careful not to cause too much of a change to the extracellular structure because it could cause major inflammation issues. Again, a second thing is, and this is a kind of a warning slide, I guess. Um, you know, cells use the matrix as a kind of super highway for movement. So we need to know how much is enough and how much is too much because we could cause more of a problem if we target too much. So essentially that's the problem. Since this is an educational lecture, um, I brought up these two slides that represent five years work each for James and uh, David, but essentially these slides are to try and tell the audience, I guess, why do we work in 3D or why do we work in vivo? So the top movie is looking at um, using FLIP to look at EMT and looking at cell-cell junctions. In the chymogram, you can see individual junctions and eventually how they wear away and actually break down. We can watch this process over time. So we need to watch, we need to give time, it's point one. David showed this in a three-dimensional and in vivo setting. And this is where we have KRAS and Newton P53 driving pancreatic cancer. We cannot see this EMT change if we do it in 2D. And so we would have given up. So I guess to the audience, what I would say is we do need to work in 2D. It's faster, it's cheaper, but we need to also increase our fidelity and increase our models so that we don't miss very important biological changes of like the unzipping of cells. Where David essentially went on and said, I can predict when these cells are unzipping, I can give a drug like the satinib, which uh, stabilizes them early before movement. The one, the, the movie below, where it's this is a flim threat movie where you can see the cell switch from blue to red. This is in a two dimensional dish. So, this is lovely. And we can switch off AKT. But actually, what James found was that when he goes in vivo, those hypoxia pockets I was saying, it doesn't switch off. And we can actually target that and play around the blood vasculature, et cetera, and improve it. So, again, it's just a caveat or a warning, I guess, to the audience to. You know, we need to use multiple models 
for the big problem. No one model is better, but we actually just have to be aware of that, I guess. So this paper is a paper written by David uh, and Morgan back in the day. So this is 2018, which isn't that long ago, but there's probably so many more biosensors now than we've actually picked up in this paper. Essentially, you have a biosensor um, for practically all the stages of cancer now, from initiation and signal transduction to cellular stresses, hypoxia, MMPs, things like SARC and SVAC that drive that movement, um, low rack, et cetera, which I'll talk about today. And then there's beautiful biosensors out there for cell cycle. We will talk about CDK1 today, but there's also the Fitchy sensor, which looks at different, it changes color as we go in the cell cycle. And you can use these as surrogate markers of how well the tumor has actually been targeted by the chemotherapy. So essentially, again, on an educational point, you don't have to be an intravital imaging expert to start getting into this. You can actually go buy practically all of these, put them in your cell very easily with a transfection and start doing some two-dimensional studies. And then suddenly you can say, okay, now I'm going to do a subcut and then we can actually increase the fidelity. So there's probably a biosensor for any pathway that most people are working on. And if you're not sure about it, just contact us and we will probably already have it or find one for you um, and help to get everyone into intravital imaging, which in my opinion is what everyone should be doing, right? <laughs> um, slightly biased there. Okay, pancreatic cancer is bad. We're here to talk about imaging, but I just want to put in context why we work on pancreas. It's very aggressive. The survival in this disease is quite frankly embarrassing. It used to be 5%, it says seven here, it's moved to about 10. Um, and essentially we were using gemcitabine for years. We added the braxane and we moved from a devastating average of six months to approximately nine months, which as you can imagine, means there's low lying fruit here. Any change you make in this disease will make a massive impact because what we currently have is just not good enough. So again, that simple idea of breaking down that stroma, playing with it, looking at biomechanics. You know, cancer cells use biomechanics to feel comfortable, to feel that they actually want to move. And that's exactly what we tried to do in this next few slides. So essentially I've been talking about fine tuning um, and this in a nutshell kind of says that we can manipulate the matrix, open up that blood vessel, get better dynamic, get better delivery into the tumor. So I've kind of touched upon this already. Fibrosis is a major problem in pancreas cancer, but also in many other cancers like breast, et cetera. It allows for attachment. It can act as a barrier, but it can also act as a highway. So it's a kind of complex um, situation and we need to be careful how we target it. So again, we've seen this slide. It may well be a part of the Achilles heel of pancreatic cancer. So often the cancer problem can also be the thing if you target it, you can actually get real inwards and improving therapy. So Claire, previous PhD student, actually went ahead and looked at this and said, okay, so if you get the extracellular matrix outside with fibroblast, talking to the cancer cell, this happens through the master regulator, low GPPs, downstream rock, actin myosin, force generation, the cell can then proliferate, it's in a lovely niche, and then we've got motility. So that's a kind of general idea. If you've got massive fibrosis, this is a horrible kind of look but it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So Claire just went in and said, well, I just want to um, uncouple this. So simply, and this is a proof of principle drug here, where we've used Facidil, which is a rock inhibitor to actually uncouple this kind of vicious loop, I guess, and actually stop the extracellular matrix for that fibrosis talking to the cancer, right? Um, and so we use these things called three-dimensional organotypic assays, which essentially are little calves or fibroblasts and a collagen matrix um, or native um, collagen. They can track this over 12 days. And we have these lovely little kind of almost rubber plug type things where we can actually now start to use these to quickly address how we can manipulate the extracellular matrix. So these will be calves, for example, from the pancreas, but we'll have, we have them for breast, et cetera, et cetera. You can knock down genes in the calves, you can get very strong. And what you can essentially do is use second harmonic multifoton imaging to look at the collagen contents. You could just look for abundance, high-low. You can then use that 
image and then start to look at cross level um, Qualcomm's matrix analysis, which essentially looks at it's not just how much collagen is there, it's how much it's interwoven. And that interwoven collagen is much more dense and much stiffer. And that is actually what we actually want to target, not just the simple abundance. Um, and again, that comes back to that fine tuning. And as I said, you can do various AFM measurements here. So once you've got those plugs, you put them on a metal grid, and then you can take cancer cells and put them on top. So what we do is, because this is in yellow, we've got the calves from the uh, pancreatic model, we can take primary tumors from the KPC pancreatic model, which we know, you can see here the primary tumor, and down here you can see it moves to the MET and actually starts metastasizing the liver. We can take these cells, put them on this matrix, and allow them to invade. These assays can take two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, which sometimes is great because you're actually often using simple Boydian chambers, etc. You may miss things. Whereas here you can actually let this go for a very long time. And we can do large, high throughput versions of this and then stain them for invasion, proliferation, survival, anything you fancy, you can stain these. Okay, so I'll give you an example. So here's a plug control, lovely contraction. We can monitor this just grossly. Facida, when we inhibit that rock signaling pathway, the matrix is much larger, so it doesn't contract as much. If we put that in the multi-photon, we can see that the SHG imaging reveals that there's actually less cross-linked collagen. So SHG is actually picking up the cross-linked collagen. If you've just got very nascent collagen fibers that are not cross-linked, it won't pick it up. So we can see that rock inhibition is making those fibroblasts not interact as much, not interweave, and not make such a dense matrix. So we wanted to say, well, what's actually going on here? So we made a movie during this contractile phase. So up here on the right-hand side, you can see the control. You can see gorgeous little calves, little interaction, very transient interaction, constantly manipulating the extracellular matrix. It's not very bright here. If you look down below, in 12 days, you have an even, beautifully matrix kind of matrix down here at 12 days. If you look up in the right hand side with the Facidil or the rock treatment, the cells are still interacting with that collagen, but if you notice, they're actually stuck. And in fact, if I point to this one here, it looks like something's caught in a spider's web. It is interacting, it's remodeling the collagen in its area, but it's not actually doing it all over the matrix. So eventually, what you have is a little bit of more kind of almost porous matrix, not well interwoven, and presumably less stiff. So we are not ablating and coming in with a sledgehammer here, we're just slightly and very subtly treating that matrix. So essentially we do AFM, and that's exactly what we see, they're less stiff. We do SEM just to confirm that the integrity is messed up, and again, that's also true. We do that GLCM analysis, where we can look at the cross-linking, and again, the cross-linking is reduced. And then with Tom Cox here at the garden, we can look at biorefringence. And essentially what this shows is um, yellow, red, green, which basically means nascent or medium biorefringence. And again, we can actually look at the maturity in the cross-linking. And again, Facidil is reducing the maturity there. So the take-home message here is slight manipulation or rock inhibition can impact um, on collagen integrity. So then we said, well, what does that actually do in cancer? And so we do this simple experiment. We can give the drug during the contraction phase. We can give the drug during the invasion phase. Or we can actually wash out in between. So we have four kind of simple scenarios. So we can either give it during the contraction, give it during the late phase, give it continuously, or wash out in between. And essentially, this is what we see. If here's a control scenario, we have the pancreatic cancer is here, highly invasive. If we just treat here, mess up the matrix, wash it out, and then put cancer cells on. They've never seen rock. All they see is a softer matrix. Now they can't move. So a tiny little treatment, cancer cells have never seen the rock. They don't invade as much. If we put the rock on only in the late phase, it's too late. The matrix is still. And then if we give it continuously, it's probably just as good in the quantification as here, is that early treatment. But again, in any disease, less drug, is better, right? We want to have a minimum toxicity with off-target effects. So we're really excited by this, and we call this priming. So early treatment with Facidil, 
wash it out, make a soft matrix, and then we ask the question, now what happens if we let the cells embed, which will be reduced, but also what happens when they get chemotherapy? Essentially, I won't go into too much detail here, but Bacidol itself doesn't do anything in terms of chi 67 so this is for um, um, survival, sorry, survival here is in the clade caspase here, and chi 67 was kind of looking at the cell cycle. Um, and so what we essentially see here is the priming doesn't do anything. The chemotherapy in green does what we expect, but if we do both, we can actually improve that. And so this is a tiny treatment before cancer cells even get chemotherapy. So less matrix, less invasion, sorry, less stiff matrix, less um, invasion, but also the cells are responding better to chemotherapy. So Claire thought that was really cool. And if you're in our group, you're not allowed to do static imaging and you're not allowed to do static testing where they watch how best to treat this. So what Claire then did is said, okay, let's go and use a biosensor. So hold your hand on this. Um, what we essentially used was a CDK1 threat biosensor. And what we know is that gemmabraxin causes a G2M arrest and CDK1 rapidly increases during this phase. So if you look below, control is in kind of yellow. When we give a braxin, you can see this switch um, to blue, and we give a CDK inhibitor, we can switch it back. So this is a really nice single cell analysis tool to actually watch drug targeting, um, but also temporally watch that phase. And so Claire then did this in vivo experiment. So remember, these are just simple cells now put in a subcut. So you know, there's, it's not that hard for anyone on this call to actually do such an experiment. Grow the tumor, give the priming, give a rest to mimic what we learned in organos, give chemo an image. And essentially what she saw was we could quite easily watch the switching of these cells and look at CDK1 biosensors as a surrogate marker. And essentially here what we can see is we can actually look at the response. We can actually see again that that combination actually causes a beautiful enhancement. You can see the image here of the response to chemotherapy. So what we learned in 3D organotypic assays then taught us what to do in vivo, um, and that was relatively fast transition. Okay, so we have to think of the bigger picture, right? Which is we're treating that tumor, but at the same time, that tumor is also moving, for example, to the liver. So here's a beautiful movie where you can see in the liver, the SHD, you can see a large MET, you can see small METs. And essentially, we did the same experiment, which did IP injection, primed with Bacidil, had a rest, gave chemotherapy, and essentially what we found was we had reduced metastasis. And again, by using biosensor um, imaging or flim threat imaging in the liver, again, we can see even those cells that made it, those small, tiny pockets, are still responding better to chemo. And so we can do essentially rounds and rounds of treatments. And we can see that we can actually reduce the MET itself, but any MET that may make it, it's still responding to chemotherapy if we're manipulating the matrix because the matrix can be manipulated not only in the pancreas, the liver itself as well can be reduced. Okay, so next slide. So Asher in the group then went ahead and said, well, what happens to blood vessels? So this is a cool movie up here where you can see the blood vasculature. You can see the collagen around it. And these quantum dots, you can almost see them pouring out. So what happened was when we take Placidel and relaxed um, extracellular matrix, we're also relaxing the blood vessels themselves, right? And changing the kind of ratio of interstitial fluid pressure such that we can open up those muscles to a point. Remember, this is priming, so it's on, off, on, off. We don't do it continually, so that because that would ruin and damage the blood vessels over time. But what you see in the control down here is beautiful blood vessels all contained versus faster we've got a relaxed and improved drug delivery um, in these cells. So in, in this model. And again, with TreeFan, we actually also used various markers that are not shown here, and we can watch that there's an improved delivery. And those markers were pressed approximate sizes of the Abraxin, which is the larger of the Gem and Abraxin combination. So we, we're not only reducing metastasis, we're increasing and improving drug delivery, both by slowing down that fibrotic process, but also changing uh, drug delivery itself. Okay, so that's in a mouse. So working with uh, Marina Paget, we then said, let's do this in the human. So essentially took all 
the patient sample from the APGI. There's a screen of each of these TMAs, and you can see certain people have lots of fibrosis, certain people have low fibrosis. And essentially, with Marina, we said, well, I presume this drug treatment would work better with people with high collagen fibrotic problems versus low. And that's exactly what we did. So we then took those patients, we grew them in a subcut, and to cut three years' work into one slide, which pains me to say, um, we did an off-topic injection into the pancreas, getting that high fidelity signal, prime for a few days, chemotherapy, and keep going and going and going. So if you can see the images here, these are just simple iris imaging. But essentially, if you look over here, you can see the black line. This is the control. Facidol itself doesn't do anything, which is what we expected. And the green line, this is standard of care therapy. Um, and so, you know, you can see a response. You have two medical mice here that somehow survived. But when you see the combination, we're way, way out here, almost kind of doubling that survival, which is something we've never really seen before when we started to do these experiments. So it shows that, um, and I haven't shown it here, but when we take those um, mice or, or patient samples that have low fibrosis, this isn't the case. I'm just showing you the one where it is the case. So we can stratify which patients should get this therapy, and the ones that don't, we need to move on and say, let's try another scenario. Okay, so just a little summary of that. Treatment with fast hour walk impairs the integrity, decreases the invasion, improves chemotherapy, right? So what we're doing with this now, so I won't labor the point here, I'll just click up two slides. And Marina's kindly allowed me to give this slide here. Facidil is not clinically relevant. So Marina and I have now managed to get a Cancer Institute fellowship with Phoebe Phillips, David Goldstein, and um, David Thomas here at Garvin. Um, and essentially that's enough to run two clinical trials using a different antifibrotic and pancreatic cancer. So we're super excited about that. But just this slide here really shows you, Marina has made um, gem resistant models and actually shows that you don't see any difference here, however, once you combine with walk, so in gem resistant settings, you gem itself causes a fibrotic reaction. So again, those patients that might not have had lots of fibrosis, once they are resistant, they've got lots of fibrosis, and it's a problem. And we combine with a walk targeting, now we have these massive effects. And I mean, obviously, this is the best graph that she's shown, but to increase this by four times is like life changing kind of stuff. So that's really exciting, and it just shows you that. You know, there'll be lots of people on this call saying, how does imaging go to a clinical trial? Well, I challenge that that is the way we need to be because otherwise we're doing snapshot images and it's guesswork. Simply looking at this, we can actually say, if you've got high stroma, you get the drug. If you don't, you don't get it now. But one day you'll be fibrotic and maybe it can work, if that makes sense. All right, so. I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for this slide. Okay, so Kendall in our group, um, I've just summarized her entire eight year of work in one slide. Um, so she got this gorgeous science advances paper where she essentially did the same kind of thing where what she's done is she's actually looked at full cohesion kinase that sits at the interface between cancer cells, calves, and the extracellular matrix. She's gone through, used a biosensor here picked out patients that have got high low, put a biosensor into those patients, which is patient samples, which is amazing, and um, stratified this. The work is absolutely gorgeous, and I don't have time to go through it all. Um, but then working with Amplia Therapeutics, this is now past phase one clinical trial, and it's going into phase two this year. So again, imaging, clinical trial. I'm just trying to get that point across, because <laughs> sometimes that's hard to say. Um, so I really think that Understanding the extracellular matrix and the cancer cell interface is always kind of the key for me. All right, so I'm going to change tact. Um, otherwise, it sounds like it's a permanent um, fibrosis talk. Oh, this is the slide that Ken was just sent. You can see the control, the gem. This is green and red cells. This is Fitchy biosensor, which looks at cell cycle. So as the cells um, become more green, that means they're responding more. FAC itself. Um, is amazing. This is in the liver, and the combination we can barely see any tumors left. And again, most of those tumors are green, which means the next round will actually cause a response. 
And essentially, you can see the survival here is, is, is lovely, and we can actually reduce metastasis. And Kendall opened up these mice. 50% of these mice didn't even have a tumor, and she couldn't find them. A lot of this is time to metastasis is really expanded. So, you know, hats off to Kendall for working a whole honors project, a PhD, and half of a postdoc on one paper. But I think it's worth it in the end. So um, I'll move on now. Right, let's do, let's have some fun with, oh, there's a funny movie spinning around. Okay, here's another mouse we've made. It's a raw biosensor mouse. So again, the interface between the extracellular matrix and raw, it's a master regulator. And essentially, this is a FET mouse. You can look at the skin, intestine, pancreas, the liver. You can have a lot of fun looking at various different biologies. And then once you understand them, you can say when you would target them. Um, we made another mouse, which is the RAC mouse, so RAC and RAW. And so the idea you can look at RAC as well. And again, we've just published that in Cell Reports. This paper was the original paper. There's another paper on Cell Reports where we've actually shown we can use this for breast cancer in a similar fashion to I just talked about um, RAW. Uh, sorry, well, Okay, so um, sorry if anyone's squeamish. I'm now about to show um, movies of an optical window on a mouse. So if you can just look at the mouse here, going around, it's relatively happy. I'm not sure how happy we would be if we had a titanium window on our intestine, but you can see it runs around. And what we can now do is say, rather than look longitudinally and say we have to kill 100 mice to get all the different time points, we can actually have this, these optical windows on the pancreas, on the liver, on the intestine, and we can look deep inside abdominal organs and we can watch a tumor before treatment, after treatment, during treatment. So basically this mouse is almost like goes to the dentist, we knock it out, we image for four hours, we take it back. So this is a big technical advance to actually being able to use these biosensors with this kind of technology, and then we can watch things that we wouldn't have seen um, on that static scenario. So this is one of my favorite movies. And this is just a whole bunch of neutrophils swarming into an area of damage. And look at how they rip apart um, the extracellular matrix. And on the right hand side, you can look at role dynamics and you can actually correlate what's happening with the extracellular matrix with when role activates. And so we can actually start, this is actually called neutrophil swarming. And we did this with Tatiana here at the garden. And again, this is in that role paper in Cell Report. So if you want to check it out. But again, what we need to do is actually say, well, you know, how best can we use this and why would you use Windows? So this is again one slide or two slides from the entire paper, but grow a tumor, we treat with geminobraxin and then we can do daily intravital imaging. This is work done with Max Bobis in the group. And essentially the next slide can show um, what we can see here. So in a long story short here, what we've got is we've got cancer cells and we've got calves, which we talked about before inside the tumor. We found a new target called Perlican that we can actually manipulate the extracellular matrix with. And the idea was just targeting Perlican may change the structure of extracellular matrix improve chemotherapy. And that's essentially what this slide shows. So without going into any detail, um, Geminobraxin doesn't work at 24 hours. The cells are still yellow here, 48, yellow, and then blue. So 72 hours in the graph here, it kind of takes until you get response to chemo. Using optical windows, we can now see that, well, actually, we can see switching already at 24 hours, 48 and 72 hours. So slight manipulation of extracellular matrix using the biosensors. We went in any more detail than this in the paper, but we can essentially watch the timing of when is enough and when is too much. And now we're actually trying to target Perlican using various um, antibodies with AstraZeneca. So you can then start to say, this is just a knockout, but if we can actually now give drugs, we can optimize when is enough and when is too much. Right. Okay, so now I'm having fun. Um, Max again went on and worked on this gorgeous paper where they actually grew tumors. And had they not done optical windows, these tumors just weren't growing and we were about to give up. And just before he was about to give up, he said, I'm just going to put the mouse on the microscope. And then suddenly he saw the tiniest of tumors. So then he said, right, I'm just going to wait around for another month. And then once he did that, we actually looked at DNA damage and stress and acting in the nucleus um, with our collaborators. Um, the project down below, 
again, Max. So basically, um, if you think of uh, Beyonce and it's like put a ring on it, if our group likes a project, we put a titanium window on it. So we really love any project that you come to, we will make sure um, that somehow we can actually advance it by looking at longitudinally and looking at imaging. So this is really cool. Max actually put a window on the back of the neck of a mouse. This is where the brown fat is stored in a mouse. Whereas you can actually also put a window um, for visible fat and you can actually look at um, AKT while you give glucose or insulin, et cetera. So quite often you wouldn't be able to see these subtle changes, but um, if you watch this over time, you can actually use these biosensor mice, not just for cancer. So we spread out into completely different diseases. Uh, and this is what with Herbert here again at the garden is interested in um, various metabolic pathways. So Sean in the group, who is absolutely amazing at imaging, basically said, all these flim fret movies we are doing are killing my life because you'll be down there to get a decent flim signal. You have to accumulate enough photons to actually get a decent fit so that you can actually say, right, the lifetime has changed and we can really believe it. Quite often, the mouse is moving. The respiration, subtle things like peristalsis or even blood vasculature can take a movie that's gorgeous um, and then completely ruin the day because it moves. And so that's a real bottleneck in intravital imaging. And anyone in intravital imaging always shows you their favorite movies and they don't tell you about the 89% of movies they have to throw in the bin, right? So what Sean did is let's change this. So just before I go on here, in vivo to get a decent signal, we're usually on the current microscope, we've got newer ones now. It was around one to two minutes to get a decent signal um, that we could trust. So you can imagine there's a lot of movement during that phase. So what Sean did, I hope this movie works. Oh, sorry, before we go on, we'll just generally say why we want to do this. We've talked about spatial distribution of drugs, longitudinal, molecular probes, different proteins, we only do simultaneous. We looked at vasculature colon and hypoxia. You can imagine all of these things are difficult to look at and we need to be able to do it. So Max's stuff, looking at the raw biosensor. I'm just going to click through here. David looking at those, that, those chymograms of cell-cell junctions really needs stability to be able to actually do those movies. Sean's mixed the raw and rack mouse and you can actually look at raw and rack simultaneously, single cell level. You can imagine how hard that is. And again, I've talked to the Claire project about the ECM. And then James, who's actually looked at AKT and using PLIM and the AKT FRET biosensor to look at tiny little single cell pockets inside the pancreas to actually say, can we actually look at AKT and hypoxic region? All of these things are, as you can imagine, very difficult to look at if you've got any movement. So I'm gonna give you an example of what Sean did to improve all of our lives, really. Um, there's the movie that Sean usually achieves on a Friday and says, I'm not coming back to work on Monday because if this is the kind of stuff we get, then why bother? Um, this is looking using an optical window into the intestine and just simple peristalsis. Tiny movements can make the total image that we acquire over time um, completely out of focus and unintelligible and we can't use it. Um, so now I'm going to show you the movie of how he solved this. So I have to hold your hand through this movie. This is my favorite movie. Um, so this is before, so you can see the kind of before correction and it's going to be purple and green and you're going to see the green moved around because that's the real, and that this is where the original um, stack was. You'll see after correction and then below, you'll see the accumulated photons for the film image. Down here, you're going to see where we used to live and here you'll see the correction. So I'll just hopefully play this um, and you can see. So you can see lots of movement up in the top left-hand corner after correction. But well, it's 16 seconds now, and most of those accumulated photons, we can't get a decent flim. Now on the right-hand side in the bottom, our life is completely better, and we can actually massively improve our response. 
You can see sometimes there's a rejected frame. The movement was just too much. But essentially, by doing this for each frame, rejecting frames, putting them back together, and having that kind of rigid alignment and then predicted alignment, um, we can actually get a really massively improved response. And it, this means that the amount of time on the microscope is less. The efficiency of what we can achieve is more, and it really has changed all of our lives. So this is where Sean was, rubbish, and then I moved to publish. So I mean, it really did make a difference here. And I won't go into the details of drugs, but quite often we were given scopolamine, for example, to stabilize the smooth muscle and stop the, um, and stop the peristalsis as much. But what we found is that that drug itself was affecting the pathway we were interested in. And so really, you have to watch about all the drugs, whatever you do, um, that it doesn't affect the molecular pathway that you're actually interested in in the first place. Okay, so Sean then used this to image in the liver. So intrasplanic conjection to the liver, put a window on a mouse, and can actually watch individual cells using firm fret, extra red weight. Now, this is looking at a SARP um, biosensor mouse, which I talked about before. You can imagine the liver is so close, for example, to the respiration, etc. cetera, that you've got lots of movement. So now using this um, tool, which Sean calls Gillian, to stabilize the image, we can actually do much more, I guess, ambitious <clears throat> organs to actually start doing slim in these various organs. Um, and essentially, he went back to Claire's uh, science translation paper and said, I wonder why they're not making good mechs. And it turns out that you can actually watch individual cells its SARC activity and SARC engagement was significantly reduced over time as the cell was started to extra regret. So, um, and the great thing about this technology as well, and I hope this uh, movie works, this is a movie from Cree Fan here at the Garvin. Um, it's useful for flim threat. We made it for flim threat, but we can actually use it for anything. Any kind of fluorescent imaging is of use. So Tree had made these um, wonderful movies. Let me see if this works. There you go. This is Osteoclast Fusion Vision Event. Tree has to make these movies for 10 hours. They have to stay in all night, overnight. doesn't matter what happens. If you get a good movie, you have to stay. Now, they had enough movies, but they had a whole bunch of movies that just completely went out of focus overnight, and it was ruining their lives. So we then took some of their movies, retrospectively used uh, Gillian to actually stabilize those images and actually brought back three or four or five movies, I'm not sure, back into the paper to increase the number. So <clears throat> the beauty here is that this tool can be used retrospectively. So if you think you've got movies that you're actually sitting in the computer useless, you can actually try and um, use this to see if it can stabilize. And again, Sean is more than happy to help people. Um, you can also use this again in the clinical setting. So Sean flew up to Queensland, and in Sean's old life, he made his own handheld multi-photon. But essentially, you can actually image humans, right? So with no correction, axial correction was like this, and then lateral correction. So you can get this was actually. You, you don't realize that if you put your arm, I'm not sure many people on the call have ever put their arm under a multi-photon, but your arm really does move. Um, so we have to actually correct that phase as well. Also, if you want to do Z stacks, there's going to be movement because it takes a long time to acquire those flim images. And so by the time you put it all together, it's all out of focus. So again, this can kind of help in this area. So Sean calls this uh, Galen, um, which is goddess of the calm seas, which I think is pretty cool. It's free, anyone can use it. Um, I said to him, can you just make sure there's big green and red buttons so it's easy for everyone to use and don't overcomplicate this scenario. Um, so I just think that this image correction has opened the door for intravital imaging, but it's also useful for clinical imaging, whether it's, um, there's lots of work um, and intestine, for example, and endoscopies for phlegm imaging. And so these kind of technologies could possibly help in that setting. Okay, I think I'm finished after this slide. This was a recent review we wrote. <coughs> We're always talking about anesthetized mice, right? 
but these mice are knocked out. I've got all these drugs, the blood vessels. Do they really recapitulate what that blood vessel was like um, in a live awake mouse? So lots of people in the intravital world are now doing awake mice. And so we drew this picture here where you can actually attach, <coughs> attach a microscope to the brain. You can do biosensor imaging in here. This is like an air hockey table. So the mouse is constantly roaming around. You can do interactions with other mice. Even you can watch um, signaling while the mouse is eating, for example. There's so much out there. I think stability and image stabilization is kind of going to be required for this future of um, intravital imaging. We don't do awake mice imaging yet, but um, what you don't do now is what you should be doing quickly. I also should get left behind. So I just thought I'd put that up. Um, and again, actually this the cool thing here is you can watch inside the brain, but you can also parallel watch how that animal is actually eating or feeding. So you can watch like the feeding process and instantly simultaneously watch what's actually going on, for example, in the brain. Um, and this is a lot of work's been done in Finland actually on this. Anyway, so I'll leave it there. I really appreciate it. I don't know if I've talked for too long. Um, I'd like to thank everyone in the group. So this slide has half of Scotland and half of Australia on it, and then half of every other country. Um, you have to work with so many people, um, and it's much more fun if you work with lots of people. So this is the group. They do all the work. And this is me up here. Um, and this is all I do. I just surf. And um, people think I put this up just because I want to show off one of my best waves, but I'm <laughs> actually saying that I'm just lazy. And these are the actual smart and clever people all here that do all the work. So I think we'll leave it there. I'm happy to take questions. And again, thanks everyone for your time. Uh, th thanks, Paul, for a fantastic talk. Um, beautiful images and beautiful videos. Um, I've opened the floor for questions. Hi, Paul. This is Roberto. Hi, Roberto. Hi, how are you? Hi, mate. Hey, quick question. So it's interesting. So modulating the, the uh, fibrosis or collagen, you get definitely benefits. Have you tried since uh, fibrosis is also originated by inflammation to use anti-inflammatory, just some of those that are around in clinics, some that target specifically some, uh, you know, uh, immune cells that like, you know, stat inhibitors or things like that. To yes. see whether you can ameliorate the the, uh, the therapy and look at collagen at the same time. Yeah, thanks, Roberto. Oh, brilliant question. And yes, that's exactly what we're planning to do. So Stephen and Tree and I, we have a large grant now, and we've just set up the ACRF Insight Center, which is looking at the immune system and cancer, basically, and looking at various inflammation, various you know anti-immunotherapies, etc. And you're absolutely right. Um, the slide that I showed when I was looking at those neutrophils, for example, our colleagues at the Beatson have actually already gone in and, yes, done exactly what you said, manipulate the immune system. The immune system itself, like you saw those neutrophils coming in and wrecking and smashing up the extracellular matrix. If you do various CXCR inhibitors, you can actually slowly manipulate that, Roberto, as you say, get a nice change to the extracellular matrix. Suddenly, you can change the immune infiltration or you can just simply change the chemotherapy. So I think that, I don't know if Tom Cox is on here right now, but um, Tom Cox says the matrix is everywhere. And we used to ignore it and just say, let's target the cancer. It, it doesn't make sense, right? Everything you do is going to affect the environment. And what, if, we, if we can understand and watch that, we can fine tune tiny little changes makes that cancer much more vulnerable, Roberto. And I think that's a perfect question. And we couldn't do that. And, and Stephen can probably talk to this, but Stephen's now making the, using adaptive optics for tree to go deeper in our bone. But the mm -hmm. other aspect to the grant that we've got is we've now got um, faster flim threat. Because previously when I was looking at cancer, you would sometimes see this streak and you would say, what's that? And you go, it's an immune cell. They're far too fast. We can't image it. Now we can go faster. And so that's exactly yeah. what we've got. And so we will be, um, I think Alex is on this call right now. So he's just been hired to um, really take this off. And so he started to play this this month. So perfect question. 
Thank you. And, and a quick one, technical. When are you making mice with two or three FRET sensors for different GTPAs at the same time? Let me know. I will come to pick them up directly from Sydney. <laughs> Stephen, I, I just work, I work for Roberto. I'm actually his postdoc. Um, yeah, so we have, we combined the VORAC. That was very difficult. I think now, and Roberto, you and I are writing a review on this right now about yep. multiplexing. And there's so many single fluorophore uh, biosensors now. I think that's the way to go. We have made a secret uh, DNA damage mouse that is multiplexing and looking at single cell strand DNA breaks and double strands. Every mouse we do, we try and improve it to get multiplex. And we also try and do something that makes Roberto happy. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, I think Barry and Eureka has got a question, yeah. So just to quickly follow up with that. Paul, that was amazing. And they, the falsadil, you know, the rock inhibitor, the fat inhibitor is really incredible effects um, in, in combination with the gemcitabine, abraxane. Have, have you tried it with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors yet, the, the falsadil or the FAC? Yeah, perfect question again. Um, so we've got a grant to do exactly that in breast cancer. Um, I'm waiting until March the 31st to sign the contract um, for breast cancer. Um, and again, back to the Insight Centre that we've got here. Again, this is not a plug for the centre, but the centre is based at Garvin, but it's for everyone in Australia and it's for anyone abroad. And Tree's really pushing the whole virtual thing, which is, Roberto, you might not need to come to Australia. You just say, can we cross these mice? Can you do that imaging for us? And that's the purpose, right? But um, I think rock might not work by what we've got the rock 2 inhibitor, and it's used for graft versus host right now. But again, I don't believe anything that's published anymore. I just say, let's combine it, image it, see what happens, right? It's yeah. the easiest, fastest, unbiased way of doing it. With FAC, Margaret Frame has definitely suggested that the FAC inhibitor would definitely work with immunotherapy with her recent cell paper. So they're already doing that. In fact, they're doing that with Amplia. Um, so we're still staying clear of that. But we've improved Gemini Braxin, but we've now just made another deal and discussion with Amplia now to actually move this to things like Fulfurnox, which are now becoming the big treatment in pancreatic cancer. Very toxic. But if you can just do a little prime, then do that chemo, you actually might win again. And you can actually prime um, the, the pills or you take them in the house, right? Cool. Thanks. Uh, I think Eureka has a question. Um, how tricky is extrapolating these mice treatment studies to human dosage-wise and personalized medicine in cancer? Yeah. I, I hope it's uh, like the question is more like I think you've you've uh, you've made yeah the presentation was pretty amazing and I think it's an uh, an amazing screening system right now in order to find uh, how uh, these different um, cancer types react towards different drugs but but the problem is also how can how much can this be generalized because usually we, we all talk about personalized medicine and then even in humans and uh, meaning what would the next steps be from there like um i don't know yeah maybe you can just say a few yeah no i agree um i guess what i try and do is say we'll do a quick 2d experiment instantly go to 3d then go into the pancreas and then find out that the drug works with a few doses and we never show no no one gives a talk and shows all the back story of how much work that is Patient derived xenografts, very lucky in pancreatic cancer that you can actually put biosensors in so you can start at least looking at patient two, 10, et cetera. We get some sort of idea. Breast cancer, we're going to try that. It's very hard to get them in there. Um, what we do, um, to be honest, is the companies are already on board halfway through the project and we're doing the principal. They've already done a lot of the hard work on the dosage. And then they'll say, here's our X, Y dose that we think that would match. And you can't really match a human to a mouse, but you just get as close as you possibly can. But um, quite often they'll say, look, 
we don't know why, but we're giving a hell of a drug that's not working. And then we'll go in and say, we'll, go, we'll do this dose, this dose, and your crazy dose. And then we come in and say, you should be using about this, not that. And so they then start to fine tune. It's a relationship. I can't do it. And they can't see it the other way either. So it's, you have to have that relationship. And I've been very privileged to um, have had two great relationships so far. Um, and when I worked at AstraZeneca, I think Stephen had talked about my job there, as you can imagine, I'm a bit mad. They gave me a job in Blue Sky Research, which was, we can't just keep looking at a tumor as big, small, right? They said, go away and use fine tune some sort of imaging to look at different aspects. And then they were really good to let me just take all that away with me. So work in progress, very hard question, but yeah. But great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, I've got a question actually. Um, that was a very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, really nice imaging. Um, I was wondering about the um, the fibroblasts. Did you know? Because we know that when fibroblasts are activated, they change their morphologies. Were you able to? Did you see any visualize any changes to um, the fibroblasts that are um, resident in the tissue versus those that are reacting to either damage or the presence of cancer cells? Yeah, that's a wonderful question, Daniel. Have I got your name right? Yeah. No. Uh, yes. Yeah, so on the on the SDM paper, the first, actually, you know, I'm lazy, right? So um, I just copied what Eric Sahai had done, and, he, and actually on the first um, figure of the SDM paper, we did exactly what you said there. We made a mask of the cell, say it's this shape, and then it moved and it contracted and blah, blah, blah. We actually tracked all that and color-coded it as white, red, yellow, blah, 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 and we could actually watch the morphology and we did that, and again, with the walk inhibitors, et cetera, you can eventually see over time that they were just not changing much while the other ones were still changing. And so, yeah, the morphology was definitely um, something we would see. And I would like to say that the roe mouse, Michi Matsuda is the, the person who made um, the roe biosensor, um, but we made the mouse. And he was delighted for us to come back and say, that mouse works. Now he couldn't see much changes when he worked on a dish because the morphology changes in a dish are really poor because it's so hard and stiff that once you go into those three dimensional settings or in vivo, we could see that his biosensor really works and we could coordinate row activation with what you just said, which was the morphological changes. So yes, we do see it. Um, we've now got faster ways of doing that, but at first we just kind of piggybacked and copied on right so on on that note when you mentioned about the um the in vitro setting so that collagen um gel how how is it made is it is it actually um tunable or in terms of like the stiffness um it's not tunable um well other than that you actually manipulate the calves in there um so you can put we've done various knockouts and the calves etc what it is is it's um it's native rat collagen. Um, it takes about 11 days to isolate. It then basically still has that kind of three-dimensional fibular nature. It's not just simple collagen. The calves go in, so we can take calves from a human arm. We can take calves from any breast cancer, pancreas cancer, whatever, and they will manipulate that. So tunable in terms of I want it to be X kilopascal stiffness. Mm -hmm. You can't do that as such, but I can say that if I gave rock, I could half it. So we could actually change that. And actually in the paper, the Science Advances paper, we worked again with Tom Cox. He has alginate beads where he can train them and he made them the exact same stiffness as our collagen plugs. And then we could do the experiment there and we see the same thing. And then we work with people in Glasgow where you can do these kind of pillar plates so my fingers are like really high and you can tiny little pillars. Tiny pillars are stiffer, larger pillars are more malleable. Again, we can do that to mimic what we first found in the organotypic. So the organotypics aren't tunable, but you can measure them by AFM and various things to actually find the result out. And quite often, you know, in vivo, 
the whole tumor doesn't have the same stiffness anyway. It's all over the place, but perfect question, yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. So, yeah, I have one question. So Paul, thank you very much for share, sharing your exciting research. So I have a question on the details. So uh, your, your mentions, so you use autofluorescence image on, on human, and you correct the, like if you check the skin, so you correct the, the motion. So I was wondering what's the mechanism of the motion correction? It sounds like the correction is done in real time and the very high resolution. No, so again, I can, I can do a basic version of this because Sean um, was the one that wrote this. So essentially, the first thing you do is you say, here's the reference and you get really large rigid movements. So you can correct for that. Once that's done, you can actually take individual points. If we're doing, if we're just simply doing fluorescence, you can actually watch where they move. And then he mathematically models and it starts to move over. And then I guess he just um, looks and says, that's a good enough correlation to get close enough. But he wants that per slice. So when you go in vivo on the arm, for example, I think it was NADH because that's autofluorescence, but he also was looking at SHG there. Um, and essentially it's as simple as combining those two things, but there was never a stabilization tech for flim fret because again, you need to get enough pixels to actually be sure that you've got a decent um, decay curve to actually read that out. Uh, I think Alex who's on the call said that our new setup is much faster. It's probably less individual points, but so you always have to sacrifice something. So we'll just have to see how that goes. So we might not need as much correction, but I still believe we'll have large amounts of movement that, you know, fast imaging just isn't going to be good enough for. I see. I mean, I, I have maybe a very naive question. <laughs> so the biosensor you mentioned, so I, I guess that cannot apply in human, like the diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, <laughs> I, think, I think that's, um, we, we had a previous question about that. Yeah, I would love to make, I don't think I can get the ethics, but I would love to make, I would love to make myself a biosensor. <laughs> It might make me glow in the dark and I'll never sleep again. Um, the best we can do is use transposon systems to put those biosensors into the patient-derived cell lines. And we have done that and we've published that. So Marina Pajic has published that and her gut paper, we did it on the science advances, we did it on the STM. So those are the three that that's been done in. Um, again, I want to do it in breast. Um, yeah. I can't, I just don't know where we can do that, but yeah, <laughs> one of my favorite questions that everyone wants to ask, and I just would love one day to say, yes, here, here we have the fluorescent human. <laughs> then regarding the image modality, so, I mean, if right now we don't have like suitable bar sensor used for human diagnosis, what, what do you think is the next step or the future direction for the in vivo diagnosis on human? Yeah, sorry, just sorry, I just lost concentration for a sec. Yeah, can you see that again? Oh, uh, so I, I mean, it's, it's just general discussion. So because you you show the two image modality, so you show two photon or you, you show the auto Florence's image. So yeah. I'm, I'm I'm thinking. So yeah, what's the next step or like the future direction you are handing yeah. to? You? So. So I think tree fan kind of wants to play with adaptive optics for depth. It depends your question, right? Stephen and tree want to go really deep in the bone because sometimes their limitation is if I can't get to the place that the thing happens, then how do I know what happens? Question one. So deeper for me, faster. I just want to be able to see the immune system. There is so much thermonic imaging can actually just look at kind of the water ratio limits of lipids and stuff and you can actually individually see a cell without having to do anything so people are going there um nadh is great there's lots of that kind of stuff going on um to be honest limb threat still annoys me um 
I think you can probably get away with doing it anisotropy sometimes, and so therefore it's much, it's almost instant. Um, and that would just fix the problem with the immune system moving. Um, endoscopy definitely already will definitely be using phlegm. In fact, it is. And so anything we can do there, it's really, it's really amenable for colon cancers and various things there. Um, yeah, and I think there's got there's going to be a lot of like imaging in a human. You don't need a biosensor. There is so much biology you can see using these tools that it could help surgery as well. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. I mean, if you don't mind, so then I have a question for both Steve and you. <laughs> Are you <still laughs> optic, adaptive optics to you want to image deeper? So, what would be a goal? So you want to target like how deep? So or... for the, I guess uh, for bone, it's harder because of the scattering component. So um, there has going to be a mix between like down to probably 400 microns, which is very tough. Um, so there has to be a compromise between a chemical or clearing, not clearing the tissue in life, but having some index matching medium with adaptive optics together and endoscopy, a mixture, to be able to do that on longer term, because the imaging sessions are 10 hours or so. And oh, that's wow. quite difficult, yeah. Yeah, I think, Steve, would, would it be right in that you've also not just doing adaptive optics, but you've also got an actual, oh. so you're just physically, yeah, almost physically cheap and say, right, I'm going to do the first three millimeters like this, and then I'll use adaptives to get further. Yeah, so it's going to be a, a mixture of um, clearing and endoscopy a real mixture um, just because of the time constraint yeah. i see yeah. cool w would you consider like the endo microscope yeah we, we build our own nano microscopes uh, that's what microscope's called isn't it steve what, yeah. <laughs> one's, called, one's called they're called the niche scopes one's the endoscope yes and one's called the what's mine called the molecular uh, niche, niche, something is niche. Molecular niche. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I guess uh, thank you for a wonderful session, and I thank you for all the questions that everyone asked. I think Paul and everyone's enjoyed the session very much, um, and thank you for all your time. So the video will be posted up on on the YouTube channel, and we'll look forward to the next session um, um, uh, next month. I think it's uh, going to be light sheet uh, focused. Thank you.